This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? All right, everybody is in for a treat today. You have the opportunity to hear from someone that I consider to be pretty much the backbone of our technology in terms of sales, service, and marketing automations at Florida Risk Partners, Mr. David Lefebvre. I will preface this by telling you, I can't say that I feel 100% that he is a stable individual. He he likes to kayak fish. And to me, kayak fishing is like, you know, hanging out inshore, maybe if I could even get into a kayak for starters. But this cat likes to kayak fish several miles off the coast, and I don't really need to say any more than that to have probably better than 75% of the people listening to this agree with me that he may not be stable. Well, you know, it's 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 not as crazy as it sounds, though, David. Um, you know, there's quite a few people that do it, and it's actually a, pr- a pretty safe endeavor. Although, as we know, you know, a lot of people are scared of sharks. They think they're going to jump out and get you, but, uh, you know, they don't like to come out of the water. So you really don't have to fear them as much as you might think. But no, I, uh, I love to kayak fish. It's what I do in, uh, as a hobby. And um, what I kind of, you know, gets me a chance to get away from the computer, get offline, um, get some sunshine, get some air. And um and 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 feel like I've accomplished things because it's a great day if you catch fish. Um, it's even a greater day if you're going to go offshore and you've just accomplished getting back uh, and you catch fish. Uh, not that it's a hard thing to do, right? Or that it's a miracle you made it back. Um, <laughs> I was, was going to say that's a great day. That's no, good. I don't. That's think a win. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, hey, if you you know what, if you want to go out and run a 5K. You, know, you can do it in the morning. You go out, you do it. You're, it's not going to kill you, right, for most people. But you feel like you've accomplished something if you did it. Why is it's it that I feel like? Here. Yeah. Why is it that I feel like this is a scene from Wedding Crashers and Lefevre and his buddies are at the kayak club planning on how they're going to crash the next wedding, and they give you the old "you lost a lot of good men out there" line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, the thing with this whole this whole process that bothers me the most is the getting there and getting back thing. Yeah, I don't I think I could probably psychologically talk myself into fishing two miles offshore in a kayak if I had to. But when I was originally told that this was going to happen, I figured, oh, that's pretty cool. They're going to throw the kayak on the back of a boat, drive him out to the middle of the ocean, drop him off. Then when he's done, he can paddle over to the side, hop in, throw the kayak on and head back in. And that is That is not the case. So I I do want to, I mean, to make this even more humorous, this isn't like just a kayak where you have the the paddles or the oars or whatever the technical term is that you usually go out there. I was reassured by Mr. Lefevre that it was okay because he also has foot foot pedals. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, the, um, uh, you know, just like anything, you've got different types of gear that are going to match what you're doing. You know, you can, go out and run in, uh, you know, in, in vans and it's going to hurt your feet and you're going to not perform. And, you know, you're just going to have a difficult time getting from point A to point B, 
or you can run in the finest Nikes and you're the same thing, but you're going to get back and your feet are going to be okay. So it's all about the equipment. And um, in this case, um, if you uh, pay attention to those people that like to do offshore kayak fishing, you'll notice that they have some pretty expensive equipment. It's, it's not cheap. It's about the same price as what you might spend for a small motorboat. Um, you know, we're typically dropping anywhere from uh, $2,500 to $5,000. So it's not cheap. Um, but it's, it's what you need to go out and do it safely because it's all about, you know, as much as, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about safety. You need to bring the right equipment to do the task at hand and make it happen. And, um, you know, if you really want to see more about it and anybody wants to learn, I just recommend you go to, uh, extreme kayak fishing, which is, uh, out of Pompano beach and uh, look at what some of those tournaments are like. And you've got hundreds of people that go do this stuff. So I'm not the only crazy one, right? Um, and, uh, but it, it, it's fun, but that's not what I do most of the time. Most of the time I'm fishing inshore Tampa Bay, anywhere from, you know, a few feet of water to 10, 15 feet of water. And, um, you know, calm and smooth. It's not bouncy and rough. I'm not having to go through the big waves. Uh, so it's, it's really a pleasant experience to go out there and do that. Still got to keep safety in mind. You always wear a life jacket or a, a flotation device, personal flotation device. You know, you bring a whistle, you get a horn, you make sure that, you know, you try to go out with a buddy. <laughs> what do you need a whistle for? <laughs> well, well, if, if, if something happens and you have to attract attention to yourself and you need okay. help. So my question you know, is you what scream, happens when but you it get won't... like a massive tarpon on there. I'm just picturing you getting pulled around like you're on the back of a tube behind two twin mercuries. Well, like... I don't know about the twin mercuries, but yes, uh, any large fish, they will tow you around. Uh, it's not really that you are when you have that happen. Um, grouper, kingfish, sailfish, tarpon, big shark, um, even big redfish. It's it's not that. You know, you're pulling the fish to the boat. You're really pulling the boat to the fish is what you do until you get close enough where you can pull them up and you're bringing them to the surface. So, yes, you are basically being pulled around and uh, and it, you could be producing a wake if the fish was big enough and wanting to pull you fast enough. But uh, typically not not your average situation. Let me put it that way. So, so I know there's got to be other wedding crasher fans on there. And I have to be honest, I just about lost it when you brought up the term motorboat because that is, <laughs> that's a very famous line from that movie uh, as well. So, so anyhow, <laughs> we, let, we have to get serious at some point. So one of the, one of the things I want to preface this by talking about is if you are in a sales organization or you're a salesperson or you're a marketer, it really doesn't matter. You know, David is really the, the guy that puts the gas in the engine for everything we do at Florida Risk Partners, he is not a sales guy. Kyle's not Kyle and I sales guys. David is not. David's a marketer. He's a very good marketer, and you know one of the reasons why he and I work so well together is because I don't try and do what he does, and he doesn't try and do what I do because we both know where we belong. And, and sales and marketing certainly have a role with each other in an organization. Um, you know, they, they need to play nice and get along and, and we do that very, very well. But, you know, for those of you that are insurance agency owners out there that follow us, I have a, a fundamental belief that is different than a lot of agency owners have shocker, shocker, I'm sure. But the fact of the matter is you're not an insurance agency until you close a deal and you have to do policy administration. Every effort that you make prior to then, you're a sales organization, whether you want to admit it or not. And I think one of the biggest disconnects that exists between agencies that produce well and agencies that are just insurance salespeople is that the high production agencies realize that they are a sales organization. They have systems. They need CRM. They need follow-up tasks. They need automations. And if you view your agency as a sales organization that turns into an insurance agency once insurance tasks 
need to happen, you are going to love this podcast. If you don't, you need to listen to everything in here and then do it going forward because that'll get you into the 21st century. Yeah, I think it's important, you know, that really what you're coming down to is the difference as far as uh, like a B2B sales organization versus an inbound sales organization. So are you just taking orders for insurance or are you actually going out and trying to, uh, you know, make insurance happen, essentially trying to close deals uh, with those people that are not necessarily coming to knock on your door, the bigger opportunities? Yep. So what's your routine, man? Every, every successful person we get on and talk with has some sort of routine, whether it's, you know, some of them are similar, some of them are completely different. What, what's a typical day look like for you? Well, you know, um, firstly, I, I appreciate the fact that you, you think I'm successful. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, humor and humor is a part of my life, but, uh, generally, um, you know, it's changed over the years, but generally these days, um, you know, I've been uh, consulting out of the house now for, I don't know, eight years. And, um, you know, it, it, so at the moment, it really is, um, I'm an early riser. I'm up before the sun comes up. And I typically just get caught up on the day's events, um, watching the news for a little while, spend an hour doing that, get caught up on all my email and all my communications, eat some breakfast. And then uh, every once in a while, I'll spend some time on the on the bike and uh, get some exercise. And other times, I'll just jump right into it and get my day started. So, um, you know, I, I prefer having my afternoons and evenings off, um, and and I get a lot of work done in the morning. So typically by noon, uh, most of my work is done. You know, all all the things that were on my list that I needed to check off and get done for the day, they're they're over with, and I'm now working on the the things that have future deadlines or there are that are ongoing um, for me to do. Um, and, and it, you know, and I do work with some people on the West Coast. So, uh, you know, 12 o'clock our time in Tampa is nine o'clock their time and their day is just getting started. So a lot of times, you know, every other day I'll spend, you know, a few hours working with them as well uh, right away before I can kind of call it a day and, and relax a little bit. I don't know if anybody else out there was on the edge of their seat waiting to hear what like what the routine is for leg day on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday <laughs> for this guy that's pedaling miles yeah, offshore in a kayak. But I was expecting squats, burpees, uh, <laughs> mountain climbers, anything like that. Uh, I guess it's on the job training. So well, it, it's pedaling in my kayak. It's pedaling on a bike not using a paddle. So, you know, if I was using a paddle, I'd be doing curls and pull downs and pull ups and everything shoulder and arm based. But because I get to sit there and pedal, like I'm riding a bike on my kayak, it's all in the legs. Well, obviously uh, I know what you're doing right now with sales power, but uh, you've got a pretty interesting backstory and in how you got to where you're at today. Why don't you bring everybody up to speed so they realize that you are, in fact, a credible guest and not just some guy I found at the dock when I was launching to uh, <laughs> head offshore or that we blew past. I would be the guy with the quadruple mercuries throwing the wake <laughs> at the guy, <laughs> throwing the wake at the guy in so his kayak in the middle of nowhere. Just blasting down. <laughs> well, you know, hey, um, it all started back in, you know, 86 when I graduated from the University of South Florida. Um, I, I really loved mapping and got a chance to get into my map in, into my career uh, doing uh, paper mapping, drawing by hand. And um, I was given the opportunity to uh, be the first group to start doing uh, computer drafting, taking um, engineering drawings from the telephone company and putting them into a GIS system on these big workstations with giant tablets, like four foot by four foot drawing tablet um, in a mainframe. And I had never done it before. I mean, I, in school, technology and me didn't get along well at all. Um, but I think, you know, that's because school was all about theory, not about hands-on. And once I had a chance to get hands-on, it was like, wow, this is really interesting. And I really enjoyed working with the computer and, and it felt natural. Um, so I had the opportunity, uh, essentially for the next 15 years 
I built a career out of working with Verizon or what was GT at the time and several other telephone companies and worked on mainframes, worked on PCs. I, I led large teams of people um, and essentially was responsible for taking probably about a, uh, a third of what was GTE's uh, territories and converting their engineering records from paper into CAD GIS system and uh, until we kind of got most of it done. Um, and then at that time, you know, PCs we were working on, for those people that don't know, this is about the time of 486s, right? So back when if you had eight megs of memory, it was a big deal, um, you know, and now we're dealing with terabytes of memory. But, um, you know, I had a chance to, to kind of change directions a little bit, uh, got to do some staffing. Um, and, and between the two, actually, I also had a chance, I should say, to not only just do the job, but I also had a, a, a lot of chances to interact with senior management at companies and, and get to see the business side of production and the business side of deliverables and, and getting services done. And so, um, you know, I, I felt comfortable working with executives at large companies and, and communicating with them and understanding their needs and, and what it takes to get things finished. So between that and then uh, getting an opportunity in 2012 timeframe uh, to jump into marketing and uh, kind of uh, take take the helm and start running running things and making things happen for customers, you know, really looked at it as, you know, I'm not really doing marketing. I'm not really doing digital marketing. What I'm really trying to do is um, uh, solve the problems for the client. And their problems are typically, I need more leads, I need more sales. So how do we do that? And, um, you know, digital marketing, um, you know, a lot of people said, you know, there's a whole branding side of it. And, and that's fine. That's out there. But where I focus my effort and what I kind of wanted, what I look at is more about demand generation. It's more about getting the lead and how do you get that lead and turn it into a client? Um, you know, drive that inter interaction between the person that's out there in the world on the other side of the network somewhere and get them to come to your website, get them to learn about your company, get interest in your company and reach out and touch you. So you can then talk to them. And um, so, over those years, that's really what I've made happen. And now I found myself in insurance and I've been working with Dave now for what, a year and a half or so. And, um, you know, it's what I love to do. I have to tell you that the ending of that story is way better than the beginning. That mapping sounds absolutely horrible, <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, it is 100% the reason I stay in my lane and he stays in his. <laughs> when, when he says mapping to me, I picture him out West in a stream in a kayak, like Lewis and Clark <laughs> with Sacagawea, um, you know, manually crafting maps of what the wilderness looks like in the, you know, the, the great West, but good grief. Well, well wait you, a minute. You, you though, just because, did a great job of making hang on, insurance but, but, attractive. I, I, to I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something. Okay. So I do have a little bit of a, a fun story with that. Um, so everybody's used to in-car navigation. You've got Google maps, you had your in-car GPS and you had all that happening, right? Um, I actually was the person responsible for doing quality assurance on the first in-car navigation system installed in the United States. This was hmm. a, uh, a project based out of Orlando. And uh, we had a, uh, some mapping experts. Actually, the gentleman responsible for our company was one of the, the lead people having to do with, uh, 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 with the Iraq war back in the pre-Iraq war and getting bombs to fall in the right place. So he was a GPS expert. And uh, so our job was to take the data that one company did and try to apply it over the navigation system to make sure that, you know, as you're driving down the road and you're looking at a map, the little car symbol on your GPS was actually on a road, not somewhere 500 feet to the right in the middle of a field. Um, <laughs> and I will tell you, the first one failed miserably. Um, that they didn't have their GPS coordinates, uh, all of it done right. So, you know, you could drive in Kissimmee and you'd be right on target. But as soon as you went up to Lake Mary, 
uh, you weren't even close. So. You know what? It's it's interesting that you say that because one of the things we deal with um, through work is telematics for fleets of vehicles. And I had a call with one of my clients. It's a big plumber in town that um, had an issue because the telematics said that their guy had run a red light on Adamo Drive when really he was on the Crosstown, which is running parallel to it, going like 70 miles an hour. He was nowhere close to Adamo Drive. The, the telematics said that he ran a red light at 70 miles an hour, which <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure made for an awesome conversation when he got Not back to the office. No, no. Well, I mean, that, that's what that I mean. Mapping is an essential part of all business today in the United States. Can't speak to the rest of the world because I don't travel outside the United States anymore. But I will say that, no, I mean, everything. I mean, uh, even with, you know, working with, you know, we work with HubSpot, for example, and there's applications out there that will take and say, I, you know, you can do things like I want to see all the customers within this 50 mile radius and boop, there they are. Right. You don't have to go type them in. It just looks at their address and it knows where they are within a radius or within a grid or within some sort of boundary that you draw, show me all the customers, tell me all the customers, tell me all my leads. Who's a hot prospect in this area? I mean, how can you do that? That's all mapping related. And so, you know, that that's wonderful stuff. And and it's amazing how far things have transferred or have gone from back in the mid eighties where you, you pretty much didn't have it. Um, I'll, I'll just say those little dots that you see when you go into the map, you know, the smallest one you were allowed to see was essentially three meters by three meters. So you couldn't see anything smaller than, than essentially a nine foot by nine foot square, right? And uh, nowadays, though, you look at what you can look at on Google and zoom in, um, and it's incredible what you're able to pick up and see now in comparison. And I can only imagine what you know, militaries out there are able to do nowadays versus what even we're able to do on Google, right? So they, I mean, they could look down and see, you know, what what hand are you playing in your and if you're playing poker, you know, they'd be able mm-hmm. to tell you what cards you have. So, and then exactly what's the G, what, what are the GPS coordinates of that map of cards? Let's throw a dart and hit it, right? They could probably do all that, right? Because it's it's that it's that amazing, anyways. It's wonderful crazy. stuff. So I think. I think it's interesting, though. I mean, people are wired in such different ways. You know, you have people who have mechanical minds. You obviously have a mapping mind. I don't. And, you know, it's um, it reminds me of one of my one of my favorite scenes from Sling Blade when, uh, you know, if you're wired to think a certain way, it's painfully obvious. And, you know, all those guys were out there trying to fix the lawnmower and nobody could figure it out. And somebody Mm -hmm. turns around, he goes. Hey, Carl, you're good with this kind of stuff. Why don't you come take a look? So he goes over, goes to start it, unscrews the thing, and ain't got no gas in it. Yep. That's it. (laughs) You know, everybody's- I can't believe that you've been able to (laughs) reference not only Sacagawea, but also (laughs) something late in this podcast. This is fantastic. (laughs) We got a lot of time left. Well, you know, there's a- uh, You know, in woodworking, you have two types of woodworkers. You have those that like angles and straight lines, and you have those that like curves. Essentially, it's people that build cabinets and furniture versus people that turn bowls and other artistic kinds of things. And you don't find very many many people that are really good at both. They're either really good at one or they really love one or they really love the other. I am the cabinet guy. I like angles. I don't carve I can't do artistic stuff. So, you know, which is, that's why all this is a perfect fit for me because I think that way. I, I think in, in from point A to point G, what's the fastest and best way to get there? And let's not yeah. worry about all the fluff that's going on. Let's just see, okay, how are we going to get these people to visit our website? How are we going to get these people to engage with us? How are they good that these salespeople to pick up the phone and call and go through this process that the company's designed that this is what we do for a living and how we make sales? Um, that's really what it boils down to. And I think it's what makes me a great fit for doing this kind of work. Well, it may not be artistic in your terms, but it kind of is. I mean, it's innovative stuff that you're doing and you've got a lot of experience doing it over the course of your career. What's the biggest mistake that you've seen one of these sales organizations make? 
So if I, if I, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's going to boil down to technology or tools. Um, it's really going to boil down to managing the team. Um, you know, giving people realistic uh, uh, expectations and uh, or expecting them. The, the biggest mistake is expecting people to achieve unrealistic expectations and not giving them the tools to do it. And, you know, you end up spinning your wheels. They end up spinning their wheels. And at the end of the day, everybody wastes their time and you don't get anything. You don't make sales. So, you know, how, uh, you know, nobody wins in that situation. So, you, you know, give the people the tools, give the people, you know, realistic expectations on what they can do um, and, and give them incentives to go beyond those expectations. Don't don't just don't just uh, set your expectations way out there and, and expect people to, um, to to work their butt off and, and not and, and eventually they can't get it and they give up. So. I guess a reasonable follow up to that would be what's one thing that you see successful organizations have in common? Um, so I, I would say that if I, I mean, obviously, if you give them the right tools, um, it really, it really comes down to uh, training, um, and and in in helping. Well, I'm, I'm, I have to say. B2B sales organization. So I want to, I want to kind of clarify that because, you know, there's one thing if you're out there selling to consumers and and I can't, can't go that route, but if you're selling a product or you're selling services to businesses, um, it's, it's really giving your, your salespeople um, the support they need to be successful and wanting them to, to be successful and, and not, and, 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 and helping them helping them achieve success. So so I've done channel sales in my past, and I've helped chan- and I actually had a startup where we were doing uh, helping small IT companies uh, build a channel network. And what you ended up having was in, in order to build a channel network and have an independent sales agents or or sales organizations, you know you you need to feed the funnel. You need to feed that that group of people with opportunity to, to be successful. If you don't feed it, it's, it's going to, it's going to wither on the vine and die. So, um, and I've, and it's the same thing inside internally. Um, if you don't give your sale, if you don't, if you kind of like hoard everything to yourself and say, this is mine and I'm going to work this without throwing some nuggets out there and giving your salespeople opportunity to create wins, it's just deflating. And eventually they're going to give up, but you know the more success breeds on success. So give your salespeople winning opportunities, let them get a few wins under their belt, show them how it's done, and and then you know give them the runway, give them the tools to to carry that forward and keep on and keep on building success. Back in ancient times, the mathematician Archimedes. I'm just, I, I'm just kidding. I had to work Archimedes in there since I hit Sling Blade and Sacagawea. Uh, there is absolutely no relevance to that comment whatsoever. Um, you and I work closely together, obviously. So I know your philosophies pretty well on how you attack projects, content, all of that, where you have big rocks and then you break it into small rocks. I think that any organization that is, um, looking to jump into the content marketing game, whether it be through blogs, video, or whatever else could benefit from hearing your explanation on the strategy around content. Why don't you take a couple minutes and talk through that? Sure. Sure. Well, I, I think the important thing first is just to define what is, what, what do we mean by content? Right. And um, basically content is any kind of um, written, verbal, audio, communication that you create to touch somebody else, right? To engage. In, in this case, we want to engage in people that are interested in the business that you do, right? That could be a potential customer. So, you know, um, and, and it's a big bucket and it can be a very overwhelming for people to come in and go, holy cow, you know, how do I get from where I am today to where I want to be? Um, and I think the first thing is is to recognize that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
you just cannot go out there. Most businesses, I should say, cannot go out there and put together everything that they think they need um, overnight. It just doesn't happen. So you need to be thinking about, you know, what's most important to the people that I um, that I want as my customer. Ma matter of fact, you need to just be thinking about what's most important to my current customers, because in all likelihood, that's what's most important to your future customers too. And so you want to start to think about that and saying, well, what do they need to have from me in order to, you know, pr for me to provide them great service? You know, perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a checklist. Perhaps it's a, a book on how to do something. Perhaps it's a video uh, showing you, you know, how to fix something or a support ticket issue or anything like that. You know, but because whatever it is that your customers are are, are needing, your future customers are going to need. And having that content out there, having those videos, having those ebooks, having those checklists, having that website content, frequently asked questions, all of that is is only going to help instill confidence in your future buyer that you're providing great customer service to your existing buyers because you've, you're providing all the answers to the questions that they're, that they're encountering as they move from their first touch with you and, and expressing an interest in your company to the point where they're actually, you know, making a decision to buy or not. And uh, so, you know, when we think about the, the rocks and the pieces and what you need to do, that's the place to start with what do your customers need? And, and start looking at how to how to get that out there the the most economical and easiest way uh, for you as an individual. Some people like to write, some people like to do video. You know, whichever you're more comfortable with and you're faster doing, just do it and get it out there. Gotcha. So, in in terms of when you engage with a with a new client. Is that that's that's where you start with them? Is is what, what you're trying to get out to them in terms of the content? So typically, typically, um, when I engage with a new client, the first thing I really want to know is tell me who your customer is. You know, um, mm -hmm. and so many people have a difficult time doing that. They 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 start talking, and they keep talking, and they keep talking some more, and then that leads them down another path, and then they go, well, you know, now that I think about it, you know, and they start. Next thing you know, they're off on they're off rambling. Um, you know, people need to think of their customer just as they they do trying to talk about themselves. So salespeople, you have the elevator pitch, right? You're supposed to be able to describe this is what we do in just a few seconds. You know, uh, you should be able to talk about your customer in the same vein, in the same way. Here's who my customer is. Here's who I help. You know, without going rambling on down 15 different industries. I mean, you're doing insurance sales. Well, we help plumbers and we help carpenters and we help call center, you know, and you can start just going down this list, but at the end of the day, you don't need to describe all that. You just need to say that we provide, and I'm gonna, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but basically we provide insurance solutions for businesses in the Tampa Bay or in the Florida market. It yeah, does. I call that you know? I call that the uh, Bubba Gump syndrome. Next thing you know, they're rattling off shrimp, <laughs> shrimp sandwich, shrimp soup, shrimp <laughs> exactly. stew. I mean, and you're going for days. Yeah. What so, um, you know? So here's the thing in our industry, and I don't know. There's probably the same in a lot. We we did a podcast with Christopher Cotton from Autofix SOS, where he's going in and dealing with uh, working with auto service facilities across the country. And I know he runs into some of the same things too, but what, you know, getting people who have no CRM or anything at all in place and then implementing that and trying to get CRM and automations in place, I know what that process was like for us. And so I think that a lot of the times it, it's funny because you make, you make the comment about people not being able to define who their client is. But that's one of the things we talk about in Killing Commercial, right? We talk about who is your ideal prospect. Mm -hmm. You should be able to tell me that your ideal prospect is a service contractor, plumbing HVAC, HVAC electrician that has 
50 vehicles, 75 employees, roughly $10 million a year in revenue that's within 50 mile radius of the Tampa Bay area. That's it. If you can tell me those things, then I know you have your prospect dialed in. The problem is people don't think that way. They start going, like you said, you get on a million different rabbit holes and they wonder you know, why they're not being successful or why they're constantly chasing their tail on this stuff. And so I, I understand that. I think the same thing holds true to processes. So yeah. people, they can't, they can't talk about who their, who their client is. They also can't define their process and they don't have it written out into your earlier conversation about mapping. That's really what it is. I mean, you have to take somebody's process that's probably not formalized and you have to let them explain to you kind of how it works and get it to the point where you have the ability to then make that into a logical sequence and get it into a CRM to where it's going to do the automated things that you wanted it to do. I'm interested. I see that as being a huge obstacle. Anytime you engage with somebody that hasn't had experience there before, and especially people who sometimes maybe your sales staff is saying, we need this tool, we need this tool, we need this tool, but the business owner doesn't really buy into it. And they say, okay, I'm going to shut these guys up. I'll give them what they want, but you don't have their buy-in. So I'm interested in what your perception is uh, as far as what's the biggest obstacle that you've dealt with when implementing automations and CRM with some of these companies that you work with. So there are some company, big companies out there that make a lot of money trying to tell people how to improve their sales organization. They come in, they talk to people, they look at what you're doing, you know, they walk away, they write up a book and they come back and they say, here's how you can make yourself better. Right. And, and these are usually being hired by large organizations with lots and lots of salespeople, you know, because it's really hard for an organization to, what is it, introspectively look at themselves and go, what is our process and how does this work? So, um, you know, the biggest challenge is, I mean, first off, just getting a CRM that makes sense. You know, a lot of people don't recognize, you know, there's a lot of pushback. I should say a lot, of, a lot of people don't recognize the value of the CRM, regardless of whether you're on the management side or whether you're on the sales side. And, you know, they, they all think about it's about tracking, 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 uh, tracking activities and tracking, you know, information. How many calls did I make? Is that a bad thing? Ooh, I don't, you know, again, this comes back to realistic expectations, right? If you sit down and you're telling somebody, well, you need to make 100 phone calls a day, you know, and that is like no bathroom breaks, you know, and every call can only be a matter of four minutes or less then, you know, yeah, you're going to be pushed, you know, you're going to have people that fail at that constantly. Um, but with, the, you know, if you've got a CRM, the idea is really centralized contacts, centralized management of information where everything that's being done is not lost. So if somebody goes out there and they, and they talk to a new prospect or a new, even just a new prospect fills out a form on a, on a website, you know, that ends up in the system. And that can be, something can be done with that, but it's not going anywhere. It's not falling through somebody's email. It's not going to be given to the person that's sick, out sick for the next two weeks, and and completely drops the ball on it. Um, it, it. It is. It's. It's. It, it's a. It can be a key part of it, but so many people don't realize how important that data is to their business um, until you lose it, kind of thing, right? Those that have been there, done that recognize it. And that's why all the big companies have that. You, you've got to have a CRM. Anybody with a large sales team, you, you know, you've, you've got a CRM. But the smaller companies in the insurance market or independent agencies that are out there, you know, they, 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 they've got to get over this hurdle of uh, one, technology, and two, why do I need this? You know, they're, they're used to just a flow of information coming and going. In, you know, coming in one end of the funnel and going out the other end of the funnel and there's leaks all over the place. In other words, contacts come in at the top and then they some of them make it down to the bottom where there's opportunity, but the other ones are leaking out along the side and never to be found again until maybe a year later where maybe they pop up again because their workers' comp expiration is coming up. Um, 
but you know it's important to have that CRM so no data gets lost and you can start to utilize that to not only make sure nothing gets gets forgotten or nothing gets misplaced but also to drive process to ensure that uh, whatever the successful sales process is that you've defined in your organization or the most successful sales process that you've defined defined in your organization you can you can kind of have people follow that same process because again success leads to success if you hire a salesperson based upon they're, oh, I heard, you know, Bob's a great guy. I'm going to have him come in. He knows everything, what to do. I can just give him leads and let him go. Well, you know, uh, you're rolling the dice. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. Um, you won't know until it's too late, one way or the other. It's either they've made sales or they didn't, and you just wasted a bunch of time and effort on somebody who you might have heard was good. But in actuality, they just haven't been able to produce for whatever reason. Maybe it's no fault of their own. Maybe it's a fault of the organization um, because the organization doesn't give them the tools to succeed, whereas their former employer gave them tons of tools to succeed. Or maybe it's just the person is not, you know, they're used to, you know, writing it out. And, uh, you know, they're not really as good as they thought they were that, you know, because they're, you can, you know, are they making the sales calls they need to make? Are they driving the miles that they need to drive in order to do it in order to be successful? Um, so that's where the CRM comes in is really giving those tools, making sure you've got it and then, uh, making sure, yeah, that people are able to not only, um, look at whether they're meeting your expectations or not, but obviously you can look at what they're, whether they're doing it too. So if information leaking out is, you know, something that you see as a big obstacle, what advice can you give companies to avoid that hurdle or that trap? Yeah, install a CRM. I mean, get, yeah. get, get the data in the computer because if you don't have it in the computer, if you don't have it in the, in the customer relationship management tool, right, it is going away. It is going to fall out and it's going to leak. If the data is in there, you can get the data out and it's not going anywhere. So if you've got a CRM and, and you've got things that are leaking, that means that you're not managing it effectively. You're not creating views or you're not creating lists. You're not setting up the stages correctly uh, to identify and segment the people that are in there. You know, I mean, a simple way to think about it is you have leads, prospects, and customers or leads, prospects, opportunities, and customers. Everybody's different as to how they, they want to see that. But you know the simplest segmentation is those are your buckets. Those are where the people go, um, and 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 they aren't anywhere else. They're in one of those places, you know. Um, but if you don't have a CRM at all, you yeah, this stuff's just it's gone. You know, pers it's written on a person's desk or a piece of paper or a notepad, and it, it, it's history in no time flat. Unless it's a real opportunity for them to go after, then they'll spend the time. But if it's not, they're gonna make a couple of phone calls and go, oh, well, move on to the next, to the next hottest flashy light that I'm going to go after. Um, but as long as it's in the CRM, you can uh, set it up to do whatever you want to do with it and make sure that things aren't falling through the cracks. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, it's funny. I think, you know, listen to what you said about People having tools, some are successful, some aren't. I think in some cases, the best sales job some people have is the one that gets them their job. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you know, after that, yeah. it's like they wasted all of their sales efforts on getting hired and they, they're gone. Um, you know, I know that my industry is notorious for shiny object syndrome. If we go, and I know me specifically, if I go to a conference and there are vendors, I have a soft spot in my heart for sales guys. You know, they don't even have to pitch me. I'll take the time to learn what it is that they do. And if I feel like they could use some constructive criticism in their approach, I oftentimes offer that to them unsolicited. But um, it was funny because I had a company that was, a, I, I did a our talk on hiring at an industry conference out in San Diego at the end of January. And there was a company that was exhibiting there that was all about 
um, profiling and how to use their service to profile. And so I got all of the solicitation emails saying, we understand you're doing a presentation on hiring and we really think that we would be a good partner for you, blah, 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 blah. And then when I got back, said, heard your presentation was awesome. Da, da, da. My presentation was exactly the opposite of what these people did. They had no clue, <laughs> you know, what I even talked about. I mean, I was their adversary and the whole time they were so caught up in trying to sell me something or get me to partner with them that they didn't even realize that I was basically saying, don't spend your money on this crap because I don't think it works. Um, so it's interesting. I think a lot of times though, you know, we see stuff like that and people have that approach of the, you know, get it in front of them, get it in front of them. And we're just like any fish, right? You see that hula popper or that spoon skimming across the surface of the water. We're going to go hit it just to see what happens. And we end up getting hooked. So I think that if you make the decision as a company to get automation and CRM in place, there's a lot of rabbit holes that you can go down. And you know personally firsthand I'm capable of going down many, many rabbit holes. So you have to kind of keep me on track. What would be your advice for somebody who's getting started? If they said, you know what, this is it. 2020 is the year. We're going to put a CRM in and we're probably going to start exploring how we can have some automations what would be the piece of advice you would give them to keep them from having the shiny object syndrome and staying on task? I, I think just, you know, stick to the basics. Um, from a, if you're going to do email marketing, you're going to do mark the marketing side of automation, um, pick a monthly newsletter and just do that. And, and just, you know, not, not anything where you've got to segment out your audience, like, a, you know, plumbers and electricians. You know, just you send it to all. We're going to send, you know, if you're my client or you're my interested in my company, you've got an interest in what we're saying. Let me just tell you what's going on with us in our industry, important things and, and you know, that, that are important to us and, and important to our customers. So, you know, hopefully you'll find it valuable. Um, again, basics, right? Eventually that can lead into you're going to do more stuff exactly for I'm going to say, OK, here's the you know, 350 electricians that we have, we're going to send them newsletter A that's all about electricians. And here's the plumbers. We're going to send that to, you know, to group, to newsletter B that's uh, that's about plumbers and so on down the line. But that's a lot of work and that's a lot of effort, for, especially for somebody who's just, if you're just getting started, right? So that's, that's on the email side of things. On the sales side of things, um, it really is just, just try to, figure out what your basic sales funnel looks like. What are your sales stages? Is it you start with a lead, then you then have a prospect and, and then an opportunity. And then do you have a qualified opportunity after that? Or do you have a qualified prospect in that process? You know, do you, you know, what does it look like when you're actually, you do a quote request, you know, you, you can have a 15 stage sales cycle if you wanted to, but that just complicates it. You know, start out with the basics, make sure that you can segment and move people and that you your salespeople can see where 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 the where their contacts are at. So if I've got a leads list, what does my leads list look like? And if I have a prospect list, what does my prospect list look like? Now, I could break that out and saying, well, here's who I need to call this week because I haven't talked to them in two weeks. You know, there's a lot of things you can do, but start with the basics and then grow and, and build upon it. I think I would add to that, um, just having gone through this myself and then seeing how a lot of my peer group works is that people need to enter this type of a relationship with a long-term view. And I think yeah. that the problem that you run into is that everybody expects instant results so quickly. And, you know, it just, it, it doesn't matter what it is because of that, we tend to overcomplicate things. And I, you know, perfect example right now, everybody sees a shiny object and they go after it right now in, in our environment, the shiny object is the coronavirus. And I see every single one of my peers in my industry with the exception of a select few that are doing nothing except going out and as our friend Bernie Borges would have said back in 2009 shouting at their audience what they think that they want the that the audience wants to hear instead of 
letting the audience tell you what they want to hear. And so our content strategy is completely the opposite of what everybody else is doing right now. I'm doubling down on evergreen content because this is what I know. I know that the coronavirus stuff, number one, I can pretty much bet you that there's not been a single agency out there posting stuff on coronavirus that has had somebody pick up the phone and say, I just wanted to let you know, I read your article on coronavirus. It's the hundredth one that said the exact same thing today. And I want to do business with you. You're the lucky winner. <laughs> I've been waiting all day for re to read a hundred articles on coronavirus so I could pick the hundredth person. Nobody's right. Nobody's getting any business because they're posting crap about coronavirus. And so that's number one. Number two, think about all of the valuable resources that are getting wasted, putting something out that is sensational news right now that will have zero relevance more than likely in six months. It's going to be dead. It's going to be absolutely worthless to that agency because, again, being sarcastic, nobody's going to come back six months from now and say, hey, I just want to let you know I went into the archives of your blog and that coronavirus content was top <laughs> shelf. I got to tell you, you were on point with everything you said. And I realize it doesn't mean anything now, but because you were so on point six months ago, I want to buy from you. No, what they should be doing is taking a long-term view. And, you know, one of my friends, um, Nick Ayers, uh, had a post on his Facebook page today that said, you can either spend today worrying about your future or you can spend your time creating it. And that's kind of the whole thing, you know, that, that I look at this is people want to know what the experience mod is. They need to understand what indemnity is in a worker's comp claim. They want to know what coinsurance is. They want to understand their wind deductible. These are the things that people are going to type into Google 10 years from now because it's the same thing they've been typing into Google for the last 10 years. So if you can have good, relevant content that answers questions that people truly ask, spend your time doing that. And no, you're not going to have somebody pick up the phone tomorrow because you published a blog post and say, hey, I just read your brand new blog post. I want to hire you immediately. It's possible that that could happen down the road, but you have to put an evergreen strategy in place that has got a long-term view to it, and the CRM piece is no different. You can't put a CRM in and expect it to be a magic wand that creates business opportunities for you within the first month or two. Heck, it might not be in the first year, depending on how complicated your systems are, but if you're looking at what it's going to do five years from now, and you can see how much money it saves you and how much time and energy it saves you, it, and more than anything else, just the lost opportunities that it preserves because data doesn't leak, then it makes sense. But it's an intangible. It's a concept. It's an idea. All, pe all people see is here's how much the, the price ticket is, and they, they decide they don't want to buy it because they don't invest in their business you know, with the belief that that's ever going to do anything. And I think that there are so many industries out there that are ingrained in the fact business has always been done the same way. Sales have always been managed the same way that they can't take that leap of faith. And insurance is probably the worst, in, in my opinion. It has to be one of the absolute worst. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. You are a sales organization first. Then you become an agency once policy administration is involved. And so, I think that's one of the biggest things that I would say anybody out there is have a long term view when you start. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, you know, part of that is, um, you know, it, it's the whole concept of marketing and 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 spending money on marketing is is difficult for a lot of smaller businesses. Right. And an independent agency is a, generally a smaller business. And so it, it, it's no different here. You, you've got to look at it from a return on investment from a long-term perspective, you, you're just not going to spend, you know, five thousand dollars this month and expect to make ten thousand dollars next month. That's just not going to happen. So, um, I mean, miracles happen. Don't don't get me wrong. But what you w when you look at this, yes, you need to look at it from a long-term perspective, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, there there's numbers out there that we used to talk about that you know if you if you put like a percentage what, what, how much should I be spending on marketing? You know, well, you should be spending, you know, five, 10, 15% of your budget, right? Uh, of, of your budget on, on should be dedicated to marketing. 
And, you know, and, and, and every company is different because what, what do you mean by marketing? Do you mean branding or do you mean lead generation or demand generation? Or do you mean both? And depending upon, you know, what you're selling uh, will depend upon where you want to make your most investment. You know, my thought is my, and, you know, I'm not a branding person. That's not me. I, I am not the, let's make cups and let's make koozies and let's make mouse pads and make them really cool and ship them out there. Dave, that's you, right? You're the branding <laughs> guy, um, you know, and, and that's why we're a good fit on this. You know, my job is to go, all right, well, you know, now that I got you here, I need to get you something that's important to you. And so I get your email address because that's what I want. I want email addresses. Give them to me all day long. I want your email address because without it, I can't do things on the on the digital side that I really want to do. Now, granted, I can from an advertising perspective because you can, you know, I can take every person that visits the website who also is on Facebook, turn around an ad and get your get your name in front of them. Right? But I still look at that as lead, as demand generation because I'm essentially start trying to say, hey, I know you visited my website. I'm now going to turn around and put an ad in front of you to get you to try to come back and get you to try to do something because I really want your email because <laughs> email is essentially free. It costs me money to advertise on Facebook. It costs me money to advertise on Google or Bing or Yahoo or anywhere else. Um, whereas if I've got your email address, effectively it doesn't cost me anything to send you an email five times a month you know and just, and to send a message to you to try to get you to engage with me so you know my goal is to get that email address and and to then use that tool use that email address as a tool to try to create that relationship and get you to raise your hand and say i'm ready to buy or i'm re i've got an interest i'm ready to talk is what we really want that that's really what all we're trying to do is get, get somebody to raise their hand and say, I'm here. Can mm -hmm. I talk to somebody or can somebody talk to me because I think I'm ready to buy and I got some questions. I think that it's important to add that there's a difference between advertising and marketing. Can you, can you clarify that? Advertising and marketing. Um, well, advertising, I, I, you know, you're, you're, you're giving somebody else money <laughs> to promote your brand or mm -hmm. to promote what it is you're trying to sell. And it's, it really is, it's about that short term experience. And, and I'm sure there's a, 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 a collegial definition for all of this. Okay. But you know, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm not a mark fever version, I, I'm not baby. a marketer by, tr I'm not, a, I'm not a marketer by degree. Right. So um, when well, I look for when you, I you have one. Mark, yeah, there you go. When I think of marketing, uh, it is more about I'm trying to get create awareness for my company. I'm trying to I'm trying to find avenues to where my name people when when it's time for somebody to buy something, they remember my 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 product, my brand, my solution. They remember me when you know just when they're doing that. Advertising is getting that in front of you, um, spending, giving money to somebody else to get that, my information in front of you, regardless of when you're ready to buy. Yeah, I would tell you that my definition of that would be that advertising is a component of marketing. I think marketing is big picture and advertising is one action step inside of it. And yeah. there are all kinds of different things that you can do from a marketing perspective that have absolutely nothing at all to do with advertising, um, telemarketing. You, you know, dialing for dollars, whatever you want to call it. That's part of the marketing process. It's part of the sales process, but it's not necessarily advertising. And so I think anytime that you talk to people, and I mean, even to your point, David, branding is a huge thing in terms of marketing, right? The more people recognize your brand and having brand recognition, the better the chances are you're going to have credibility when you meet them in the marketplace. That's not necessarily advertising. To me, advertising is, again, it goes back to, um, you know, a lot of what I do is based off of the stuff that I've, you know, learned over the years, but it goes back to Bernie's comment about shouting. I think advertising shouting, I really do. I think that there's a way to soften that a little bit with retargeting and targeting audiences through digital marketing and how that's transformed a little bit. But at the end of the day, 
I say, you know, when I think advertising, I think billboards, I think newspaper ads. It's funny. I was on going back and forth. He'll laugh when he hears this, if he hears this. Um, but I was talking to Ryan Hanley this morning who has rogue risk up in the Albany, New York area. And he is trying to do something to generate some uh, traction on personal lines. And, you know, I told him about the thing we did with improvemyrates.com and how we did direct mail just as a, a mechanism to see what would happen from that. We actually got really good responses on direct mail. And so Hanley gets up early in the morning. He may be up earlier than I am, um, but usually one of us has messaged the other one, if not every day, every other day, just checking in to see what's going on with some of the strategies. And this guy's a content animal, by the way. He is absolutely crushing it. He's one of the few that are doing exactly what I'm telling people they should be doing and just killing evergreen content right now. But he um, he sent me over a thing this morning and he's like, I, I look at these domains, tell me what you think. And by the way, here's the ad I'm using for inspiration. And he sends me this ad and I looked at it and I said, this is absolutely terrible. <laughs> don't, don't do this to your brand. I said, you have spent so much time building awesome content your content has a touch and a feel to it. And you're going to go out and basically take this ad campaign and go the complete other direction of everything you've worked so hard to build. I said, this looks to me like somebody's going to click a link and expect to go to an online flea market. I said, it looks like the President's Day appliance sale for an appliance shop or something, not a high touch insurance and risk management firm. And so I say that because that was the abs. This here's a guy who has been doing nothing but content to get his message out there, and you know, be able to use that in blogs and video and everything else to give his company credibility. And from an advertising perspective, if he would have gone down that road, it would have been an absolute train wreck because it's like literally standing on the side of the street shouting through a megaphone what you want people to hear. Completely different thing. And I think mm -hmm. that. A lot of times that that's a huge differentiation is advertising is shouting at people and, and marketing is a little bit, uh, you know, more of a softer approach where advertising is a component of it. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Totally. So, so listen, we're up on time. You have done an awesome job with us at Florida Risk Partners. We will forever be grateful for what you've been able to do for us just in the short period of time that you've been working with us. And um you know, obviously, as I've said, this is a long term view. I don't I think that you could honestly say that I've not ever pressured you for saying, hey, we want faster results. We want this. We want that. The pressure you get from me is a little different. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's the fact that I have the ability to go for 20 hours a day and throw 15 things at you. And that's probably never going to change. And it's been that way, you know, as long as I live. But um you know, I know that I have made some introductions for you to some other people inside our industry, and they have all been very, very impressed with the level of knowledge that you have, your level of understanding and ability to have a conversation with them to where you can um, then give them actual practical advice. I would be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to let people know how they can get in touch with you to talk to them about what you personally and sales power could do for their organization. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I've thoroughly enjoyed working with uh, Florida Risk Partners and, and you guys. And, and David, you are a, a machine, period, at the end of the day. Not only do you know how to cook, but um, <laughs> you, you can cook at the, creati at the creative, right? Um, so, no, I, I appreciate it. And, and so it's really simple. Uh, my website sales power pwr so sales pwr.com power without the, the the vowels right and um, be happy you know my contact information is there I'll be happy to talk to anybody um, you know give me a ring give me a and shoot me an email I'll be happy to sit down and converse with you about your situation spend an hour answer questions and you know see if there's a possibility for us to work together um, Anywhere from websites through marketing and sales automation and everywhere in between. That's what I try to uh, uh, tout myself as an expert at, um, although there's definitely people out there that know more than I do. But uh, I can get you from first base to uh, our home plate at least a second, round a third, and, and hopefully a home run before it's all said and done. 
So appreciate the opportunity. And uh, um, yep, if you anybody's interested, just visit my website. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Appreciate your time today. Thanks for uh, just sitting down and sharing thoughts with us. Kyle, you got anything to add before we... I don't, man. I mean, you you hit it right on the head. What he does is great for us. I, I think he's a huge value add to what we've got going on. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you coming on and chatting with us. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.